How does indirect trauma affect you? So the soldiers' trauma experiences we know from research affect their support systems. And it's not that you were directly exposed to the stress, but because they come home and they tell those stories with such intensity and you hear the stories that are very similar so often, that's when you become affected because your friends are going to tell you their uh, soldiers' trauma stories. You're going to hear other people talking about issues that were in combat. So those, that's how you become indirectly affected by any kind of traumas that took place. The stress symptoms then are communica communicable, they call it an emotional contagion, to the family member. And this is because, like I said earlier, in training we learn empathy. They don't, you don't just come into the world with a personality type that I can just close off emotions to you and I'm not affected by what you say. Most of the people who go into the helping professions are actually very caring individuals and that's why they know to train us to shut off our emotions and to not go with people into their trauma stories. But as military spouses, they don't train you how to do that. So you go in wanting to help but you don't know how to be there physically and yet not leave the room to go with them into their trauma. We learn tips on how to do that. If we do not, we suffer sympathy, and that is together suffering, together emotions, together feelings. In my undergraduate, when we did psychology, my professor explained to me that it's like symphony, and the instruments are playing so well together, you can no longer tell the difference between like the cello and the violin. So if you go into a helping situation and you are the helper and this person is hurting, if you suffer sympathy, we can't tell the difference anymore between the person who's hurting and the you who was trying to help because your symptoms start looking exactly like the person you were trying to help. This close emotional contact that you have with your soldier coupled with their um, trauma stories is how you begin to have physiological and psychological issues associated with their trauma. You may feel their feelings, you may have their fears, you may even have some of their dreams from things that they've told you about. When you go to sleep at night, you may have those stories coming back in, so you want to protect yourself from that because otherwise you become physically, emotionally, and mentally drained. This is what it looks like when you see someone who has not practiced um, empathy instead of sympathy, they end up having issues similar to trauma. And so when you see these, and we don't have to go through them, but when you see these, you'll recognize that this is what's going on and that if you see a friend who is struggling with some of these areas, whether it's psychologically, socially, physically, you'll know, you know what, this is the problem and we need to have you get help. In order to be an effective helper versus the ineffective helper, you practice empathy, you actually empower the person that you're helping. If you practice sympathy, you are enabling them because what ends up happening is instead of you listening, you start just reacting. And instead of understanding their feelings without getting involved, you begin to take on their feelings and their pain becomes your pain. So when you are listening, you need to ask questions, but allow them the opportunity to come up with the answers. Do not tell them what the answer is because then they're not working through it. You offer them advice and solutions. They didn't have to do anything and they haven't really moved very far in their um, getting through what their trauma is, is doing to them. So if we increase the protective factors, which are the things that are gonna keep you from having those negative things on that list. Um, you learn to listen and encourage, and you learn to be sensitive to them and at their level. And by that I mean you're not looking into the situation and trying to fix it or to be the expert coming up with the answer. You're just listening to the story. And that way you will feel relaxed, you will feel free of their issues because you didn't take them on, and you'll feel good about that helping experience. Whereas if you are not practicing this and you're just sympathizing with them, you're trying to protect them, rescue them, uh, control the situation, fix the situation, then you're going to feel tired, you're gonna feel anxious and fearful, and you're gonna feel responsible for others because you've taken on their pain, now you feel like you have to do something with it. 
Like I said before, social well-being is a very important thing that you're going to want to find a friend because if you can allow other people to give you hope, then you're able to have the energy to provide hope to others, whether it's your soldier that you're trying to help or your friend who has a soldier who has experienced a trauma. Good friends will listen to you when, they're strugg when you are struggling. They will tell you when you're struggling and they, will, they can be trusted. So you make sure you have a battle buddy that when you confide in them, they're not going around and telling other people, you need someone that you can trust. And they also tell you things that you don't wanna hear. So if you are, um, <laughs> they do. If you are thinking through a problem incorrectly or if you're having um, things that you're being pessimistic about, they often help you to be able to see that there's another side to the story and to look at it in a different light, to be more optimistic. And they've been through it before, you've chosen someone who understands you. So like I said, the people in this room, you don't have to stop and explain the mission. They know exactly where you are, you're on the same page, and you can pick up right there in the middle of your story and they're okay with that. You don't have to tell them the whole story because they know the feelings, they understand the emotions. You just need to tell them how you feel and a good friend will be able to help you through that. How do you self-assess? When you decide to be this listener to the trauma stories, you also need to take into consideration your trauma history. Because if you are going into this not realizing that you have past traumas that you haven't dealt with, that's going to predispose you to having your own trauma reactions. Also, if you have triggers from past traumas, you need to be aware of those, or anniversaries associated with these past traumas. Uh, if your friends tell you that you seem stressed, then you need to think about it because you probably are. So what are your stressors? They suggest that you list tasks that are going to drain you, whether it's physically or mentally. You need to list those tasks and then categorize them and bring the top three that need attention right now to the top of the list and just work on getting those done. A lot of times our stress comes from um, undetermined task. We have like this large task that we haven't tried to break down into smaller tasks and so we feel more stress from them. So if you'll break it down into doable, attainable goals, then you're able to address each of those stressors. And share your load with your friends and family. There are a lot of people who have offered to help you and you're not reaching out. So when you have the opportunity, share that load with other people. Do things with the positive people. If you always are hanging around with the negative Nellies, don't be surprised if you're pessimistic. <laughs> and end your, note, your day on a positive note. Hunt the good stuff. This is a resiliency training thing that actually they talk about. At the end of the day, try to look back over your day and find a few things that were positive, some of the things that you got done off of that list. So what does post-combat look like? Tuning out others, that reduced emotional connection that they have, avoiding social and work contact. They feel like they've been at work for 300 days straight. So they're going to be, some of them will avoid being around people that they work with outside of work. They're not going to have that connection. And then some of them are going to want to spend time around people who have experienced exactly what they've experienced because it gives them someone that they can talk to about what they've been through now that they're back home and they're in this environment. They have overly rigid and strict boundaries when they first come back. They call that a perimeter wire. If you're gonna read Bridget Cantrell's book that you were offered outside, she'll talk about how they have this uh, perimeter wire set up around them for their emotions, and so it's hard to get back in at first, but that does come back down. And a heightened protection um, of their loved one's safety. So what the kids are doing, what you're doing, the world is no longer in their minds a safe place and so they bring that back home with them and they start trying to keep everybody and, and know what everyone is doing when it comes to their safety. Judgmental, they are very, uh, some of them have a low tolerance for stupid mistakes when they first come back. And it's because when you're downrange and you have a stupid mistake, obviously it can affect a lot of people. And so they tend to have a low tolerance when they come back. They may also be cynical um, or angry at first. Anger is a form of the grief process, so they're actually working through something. I'll go over that with you in just a second so that you can see where some of that rage and anger comes from. But you have to watch that because that can lead to withdrawal and isolation. The autonomic nervous system, and I'm only going to throw these up one part at a time because it's your brain. 
Okay, the autonomic nervous system. There are two parts to your autonomic nervous system. You have a logical side and you have an emotional side. With soldiers, we train them. And because we train them, their logical side automatically kicks on during some type of stressful event. For us, our emotional side usually kicks on and we're the ones that are freaking out. That is because you have something called the amygdala, which is where your expressions of your fear, rage, pleasure, memories, as well as drinking, take place from the amygdala. The hippocampus also comes on, and that's your memory pattern. So that's what helps you to establish the memory that's going to be connected with that trauma. It also associates with the area of the brain that, that records smells. So sometimes your smells are going to be the trigger to whatever the traumatic event was. That's why, because this area of the brain kicks on and records smells that are going on during the traumatic event. As well as spatial maps, where, where these things are and so the next time they'll know when they're in that dangerous situation how to not get involved again. It's located in an area of the brain called the limbic system. That's where our emotions are stored. And the hypothalamus, that's like our regulator for homeostasis. It's how we stay normal, whether it's your temperature, stress, the mediation of our emotions, uh, pleasure and pain. So when they're going through a stressful situation, they may not even feel pain because they're capable of shutting that side off. And then as well as your sleep and wake cycles, that's why their sleep and wake cycles are all messed up because this, these areas of the brain have been kicking on and off, on and off because our brains don't tell the difference between an imagined threat and a real threat. They just come on. They're a part of the sympathetic nervous system. Normally in the sympathetic nervous system you have fight and flight. We normally respond as human beings and as animals uh, to flight first and then when we can't go any farther we're up against the wall we fight. We've taught our soldiers how to do the exact opposite. So their area of the brain kicks on and they're going flight, no, no, training, fight. So they go forward the same way that we train firefighters to run into a burning building or a nurse to run into the emergency room when it, everything inside of them is telling them go in the opposite direction. Because of that, there's high levels of stress hormones involved with that, as well as adrenaline that kicks on with the threat and the excitement. Uh, noradrenaline, which is your rational thinking, they're able to do because the logical side of the brain is on, and their moods are stopped, their emotions are stopped, their heart rate gets regulated so that they don't have a heart attack while they try to have their traumatic experience. And then as well, dopamine gets released. And dopamine is an addictive reward chemical. So that's why when they come back, they seek out behaviors and, and high risk driving your car fast or driving your motorcycle fast because they're looking for this dopamine release that they got used to having on a regular basis while they were downrange. These are the um, symptoms associated with both combat stress and post-traumatic stress disorder. They are exactly the same. Combat stress and post-traumatic stress symptoms. They are not the same issue. So I want you to understand that just because you're seeing some of these symptoms in and of themselves does not yell post-traumatic stress disorder. It does not automatically mean that the individual has the disorder. It just means that they are experiencing some of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress because combat stress and post-traumatic stress, they're the same thing. So when you look at these, you'll be able to tell uh, some of the ones that you probably recognize just uh, like the difficulty falling and staying asleep, irritability, outbursts of anger, difficulty concentrating. Those are both combat stress and their post-traumatic stress. It's disorder when we go into a longer period of time. So they both come about because we, the individual has experienced, witnessed, or been confronted with either an actual or threatened death, injury to yourself or others. Because like I said, our brains can't tell the difference between an actual threat and an imagined threat. Which is why when they're sharing their trauma story with us, we have the stress reactions if we're not protecting ourselves because our brain can't tell the difference between an actual or an imagined threat. Your brain can't tell the difference. It's gonna kick in and it's gonna do all those things. It's gonna release all those hormones the same way as if you were actually downrange with them in Afghanistan. PTSD becomes 
something that you're going to um, look for more if you still see these symptoms three months out. So as they come back and they're in a six week to eight week reintegration period, they're gonna have fewer and fewer of those symptoms that I listed earlier to be associated with the combat stress. If you still see these symptoms going on as you get to week eight, nine, 10, then you know we're not dealing with an acute stress, we're now dealing with something that's gonna be more chronic. And that's when you're gonna to wanna to start focusing in on who do I need to get to help or to listen. But in addition to that, um, if it is causing issues with them as far as distress and impairment of their functioning, like they're having trouble at work, they're having trouble within the family, those are things that are gonna clue you into the fact that this is more than just somebody who can't sleep at night. This is an individual who probably is having the nightmares and probably having other issues associated with the post-trauma. Also, we have something called delayed onset, and that is where the symptoms don't even show up until six months out. That's actually very rare for soldiers because the actual trauma has occurred, remember, in theater. So time has already begun to pass, so you're going to see those symptoms before the six month mark. They didn't experience the trauma when they got off the plane. So this, this time period has already begun to elapse. And there are effective treatments available. We have learned so much in the research world on how to treat soldiers in the last 10 years. And now that we have things called functional uh, MRIs, they call them magnetic resonance imaging, we can look at areas of the brain and we can tell when they're having these issues. We actually can see hyperarousal. And so because we know this now, we can treat them more effectively. And there are a lot of different ways, in in like CAM therapies, the uh, alternative medicine as well. We have biofeedback now, stress management. Some of you have signed up for those classes today. So uh, these are just things that we've learned now that do lower stress that we didn't know a lot about before we had so many soldiers to apply it to in research.